Get results with effective conversations. Did he say why he took it to school? He's tired of being bullied. I don't want to talk about it. He doesn't get to call the shots here. I wasn't going to kill him, just scare him. Taking that weapon to school makes him an idiot, not the victim. You're just as bad as them. Let me go, let me go. You should have come to us and told us what was going on. We could have done something. What could you have done? Hello and welcome. I'm Rhonda Shortino, Markell Insurance Company's National Child Welfare Specialist. I'm one of the estimated 12 million former foster kids in the U.S. I've spent the last 25 years working to make foster children and their caregivers safe and creating strategies to keep their relationships whole. Today we're going to talk about bullying and how a parent can help defend their child against it. Sadly, there are more kids than ever being bullied. Every day, 160,000 kids miss school because they're afraid of being bullied, and for good reason. An incident of bullying occurs every seven minutes in American schools. Although one-third of kids report having been bullied, and 70% of students report witnessing an incident of bullying, only 30% of these kids tell an adult. The most prevalent forms of bullying are verbal, physical, and cyber. Verbal bullying includes name calling, put downs, taunts, threats, intimidation, shunning, rumor spreading, and extortion. Physical bullying includes stealing of money or possessions or physical attacks. Cyber bullying is even harder to get away from than in your face bullying. It can be done 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For a period of time, the child being bullied may not even be aware that malicious pictures and messages about them are being spread. The messages are often delivered to a vast audience, including those the victim doesn't even know. Once something enters cyberspace, it's extremely difficult to permanently or effectively delete it. On many social media sites, a profile can be created with false names, so the bully may not even be identifiable to the victim. Let's look at what happens when a kid doesn't feel secure enough to report being bullied. Sorry, I got here as soon as I could. Where the hell did that come from? Is this it? Did he say why he took it to school? He was tired of being bullied. He never said a word to me about bullying. Did he say anything to you? No. Where is he? In his room. You want me to handle this? No. I think we both should be there. Okay. Let's do it. I hope those other kids look worse than you do, buddy. Todd. Sorry. You want to tell me what happened? No. No? I don't want to talk about it. You lost the right to do what you want to do when you took that knife to school. You owe us an explanation. Todd, please don't push him. If he doesn't want to talk, let's just give him some space. He doesn't get to call the shots here. He needs to let us in so we can fix this. Now, I want to know what happened. Didn't she tell you? I want to hear it from you. Do I have to? Yes. We both want to hear your side of the story. No, you don't. Yes, we really do. They called me a faggot. They're always calling me that every day, making fun of how I walk, how I carry my books, what I wear. So that's why you decided to kill them? I wasn't going to kill them, just scare them. Show them that I'm not what they're always saying I am. But you are, aren't you? You're just as bad as them! Let me go! Let me go! Stop it! Janet, shut up! You're making this worse! If I let you go, are you gonna behave yourself? Janet, get that out of here, please. Sure. Are you going to be okay? We'll be fine. Janet, go! Okay, but please remember, he's the victim, not the aggressor. Taking that weapon to school makes him an idiot, not the victim. You're making this worse. No, he did this. Now, will you please let me handle this? Okay, but David, just take it easy.
You want to give me a good reason why I shouldn't kick your sorry ass out of here? Nope, that's what I would do. You see, that's your problem. You don't know how to stick up for yourself. You need someone to take care of you, show you the entire world isn't against you. You should have come to us and told us what was going on. We could have done something. Like what? What could you have done? I don't know. Something to put a stop to all this nonsense. Nothing you could have done would have made a difference. You don't know that. Yes, I do! Well, what you've done is gotten yourself kicked out of school for the rest of the year. Now, I talked them into considering letting you back in if you go to counseling at least once a week. I don't want to go back there ever! Well, we'll talk about that when you get your head sewn back on straight. In the meantime, I'm taking away all your online privileges. No computer, no game, and the only phone you're going to have is one program to call here. That's not fair. All I did was try to defend myself. You're not getting the message. What you did was wrong. You could have gotten yourself killed. Or killed those idiots. Until you understand why you're grounded, I can't trust you out in public. I don't care. Everyone hates me anyways. Do whatever you want to me. It doesn't matter. We're not done yet. Put that away. I said put it down. Ricky, don't make me take that from you. You're me. acting just like them. Suit yourself. You and that pencil are going to be best of friends. Todd and Janet seem like caring parents. Why is it that they didn't know that Ricky was being terrorized? Did he not trust them? Was he afraid that if he opened the question of his sexuality to discussion that they would react negatively? At 13, is Ricky ready to announce his sexual preference or does he even know for sure what it is? Why did Ricky think bringing a weapon to school was the only thing he could do to stop his torment? Kids who are bullied don't tell their parents for several reasons. They're embarrassed. They don't think their parents can do anything to stop it. They think that telling an adult is only going to make it worse. But how can you know if your kid is being bullied? There's a strong chance that your kid is being bullied if they become withdrawn, their grades have suddenly gone down, they don't seem to want to participate in activities they previously enjoyed. They have a sudden and ongoing need for more money or supplies than usual. Their clothes are torn or damaged. They repeatedly have bruises or cuts that they try to explain away. Some of these symptoms can also point to other issues your child may be suffering from, such as depression. But regardless of their root cause, they're signs that your child is hurting. If you notice any of these signs, it's imperative that you open the channels of communication to find out why they're in pain. You want to tell me what happened? No. No? I don't want to talk about it. You lost the right to do what you want to do when you took that knife to school. You owe us an explanation. Be careful. You may have only one chance to get them to talk. How you approach the conversation will determine your success. If your kid is afraid of the consequences of telling you that they're being bullied, they won't open up. They're always calling me that every day, making fun of how I walk, how I carry my books, what I wear. Kids who are different in some way are prime targets for bullies. 90% of the LGBTQ community report having been bullied. Almost every child in foster care has experienced bullying in school at least once. Often children in foster care have lived in homes where they were bullied by other family members or they've watched a family member act in a fashion against other adults that could be interpreted as bullying. These kids are traumatized and live in a perpetual state of fight or flight. Physiologically, the part of their brain wired to protect them from danger rarely turns off. Their adrenaline is always flowing. Their expectations of safety are next to none. Many of these kids, especially the smaller and weaker, react to danger by retreating. This can be translated in their brain as an instinct to freeze, leaving them not only physical, but also psychological targets for tormentors. On top of this, kids who are bullied are more likely to have low self-esteem. 
and are often prone to turn to violence to protect themselves or to try to extract revenge on their tormentors. The list of potential consequences of having been bullied include suicidal tendencies, low academic performance, self-medication through substance abuse, becoming bullies themselves, eating disorders, and fighting behaviors. Let's see what was going on in Todd, Janet, and Ricky's heads as they talked. Nothing you could have done would have made a difference. You don't know that. Yes, Unbelievable. Do. Does he think he's a fairy godmother? That he could snap his fingers and make it all better? Ricky believes that nothing's going to change ever. Todd and Janet genuinely wanted to understand Ricky's behavior. They also wanted to support him, but their approach and subsequent lack of cohesiveness as a parenting team left Ricky hurt and resentful. The power struggle that Todd and Janet allowed Ricky to witness added to his confusion. Todd, please don't push him. If he doesn't want to talk, let's just give him some space. He doesn't get to call the shots here. He needs to let us in so we can fix this. Let me go! Stop it! Janet, shut up. You're making this worse. In our scenario, when Ricky challenged Todd, Janet intervened. Her behavior led Ricky to believe he could use her sympathy for him to deflect Todd from his efforts. Although her intention was to shift Todd's focus back to being constructive rather than punitive, her intervention gave Ricky a mixed message. Even though many schools of parenting would agree with Janet that kids can't be forced into honestly expressing their emotions, all schools of parenting would suggest that she discuss this with Todd outside of Ricky's presence. When it comes to matters of setting limits, effective parenting requires both parents to be on the same page in front of their kids. When parents don't support each other, it undermines the kid's confidence in their parents' authority and takes the focus off the child's behavior and onto the controversy between the parents. This doesn't mean that both caregivers need to be philosophically aligned to be good parents. What it does mean is that you need to resolve your differences when you're calm and outside of your kid's presence. If you know that you and your partner have different attitudes or approaches on how to deal with the myriad of situations that parents deal with on a daily basis, such as television or computer usage, doing homework or chores, sleepovers and discipline, you need to figure out whose views will become the house rules. Then when necessary, back that person up when they're dealing with the kids. Be careful not to create an environment where kids can pitch you against each other and then take the focus off their behavior. Obviously, this instruction does not apply to situations where you think the other parent is causing the child physical or emotional harm. It is extremely important that parents keep their calm when interacting with their kids. Now I want to know what happened. Didn't she tell you? I want to hear it from you. So that's why you decided to kill him? The minute a parent raises their voice, adopts a menacing posture, or aggressively gestures, they're triggering the fight or flight part of their child's brain. The child may shut down, tune them out, become defensive, or even aggressive. As the conversation between Todd and Ricky became heated, Janet should have asked Todd to step outside. Once out of Ricky's room, Janet could have helped Todd calm down. Once Todd was calm, they could work out a plan to constructively parent Ricky by diffusing his defensiveness and emphasizing their interest in his safety and happiness. You're just as bad as them! Let me go! Let me What's go. wrong with acknowledging the obvious? The kid's gay, so what? I didn't say there was anything wrong with it. Why is he so upset? Todd's casual labeling of Ricky, although done without judgment or pejoratives, was another factor in heightening the family's drama and causing Ricky's nervous system to go into hyperdrive. Unless your child announces their sexual orientation, even if you think they may be gay, you should not say anything to them as it may make them very uncomfortable. Sometimes even though they may exhibit behaviors attributed to members of the opposite sex, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're gay. The best thing you can do to make your child feel comfortable with discussing the ways they may feel different from others, like sexual orientation, 
is to create an environment in which they feel safe to be who they are. Never do anything to force your child into confronting something that they're not ready to confront. When they're ready, and if you've created an open and caring relationship, they will tell you. You are, aren't you? No one is ever going to look at me without sticking a label on me. I'm not a label. I'm Ricky. Why isn't that good enough for anybody? When you see people who are different from you, if you talk about them, make sure you're not being negative. If you make jokes or use casual slang that could be interpreted as pejorative terms to describe people who are different from you, your child may believe that if they voice the way they feel different from you, that you would reject them. So don't talk about others in a negative way. Obvious differences between caregivers and the kids in their care include skin color, culture, religion, age gaps, economic status, or can be any of the other things that divide us. To build and nurture good relationships, avoid emphasizing differences and intentionally find common areas. Families can come together around sports, films, music, pets or games, whatever works for your family. Find some common area where you can connect. I hope those other kids look worse than you do, buddy. Poor kid. I want to kill those bullies. I got to teach him how to defend himself. No? In an effort to lighten the mood of the situation, and perhaps out of shock at seeing how badly Ricky was beaten, Todd may have unconsciously given Ricky the message that he should meet bullying with physical violence. This is the worst possible message you can give a child who's bullied. Bringing a weapon to school or into any environment where others are gathered can never be condoned. There is no situation when a child should be encouraged to carry a weapon for protection. The weapon can be taken from them and then turned on them. Your child may lose control of their emotions and use the weapon. If it's a gun, it may accidentally go off, causing irrevocable damage to your child's psyche, their social standing, and perhaps even send them to jail. In other words, carrying a weapon is not safe for your child. In order to stop them from suffering horrendous natural consequences, you must make sure that your child internalizes the no weapons message. Teach them to protect and defend themselves using the following techniques. Always report the bullying to you. If the bullying occurs at school, immediately report it to an adult in authority. Learn to walk away from the bully when they're being verbally taunted. Children can try to diffuse the situation by using the so technique. Studies have shown that when a bully taunts a child by using an epithet or turning their sexual preference into a joke, if the child calmly turns to the bully and says, so, especially when the bully has drawn an audience, the bully immediately loses their power. However, if the bully is prone to physical abuse as well as verbal abuse, the use of this technique could put your child in danger, so they have to gauge that situation. If your child is being assaulted or extorted, it's important to create a safety plan with alternate routes to and from school. If your child has friends who can accompany them, it's best that they travel with a buddy. Seek counseling and therapy for your child so they can learn to channel their feelings and restore their self-esteem. Always make it clear to your child that they are not at fault, nor have they done anything to deserve being bullied. Punishment will only serve to reinforce their sense of self-loathing and worthlessness. Isolating them from their peers or taking away what may be their only pleasure is not the way to accomplish this. In the meantime, I'm taking away all your online privileges. Why does he think that taking stuff away from me is going to teach me anything? The only thing I need to learn is how to beat those guys up before they get to beat me. Nice talking to you, Dad. Thanks. What you did was wrong. You could have gotten yourself killed. Todd was on the right track when he insisted that Ricky go to counseling. He also was correct to insist that until he trusted Ricky to use better judgment, that Ricky would not be allowed to spend time with other kids without an adult's presence. However, isolating Ricky is not the answer. 
Instead, Todd could have insisted that Ricky only see friends at their house. Instead of taking away Ricky's online activities, he could restrict and monitor them to ensure that he was not wandering into sites that encouraged violence and retribution. The length of this restriction would depend on Ricky's progress in therapy and signs that he was improving his self-esteem, ability to interact with other kids, and where his grades had dropped, that he was making an effort to bring them up. Let's watch the scenario played out another way. Watch how Todd and Janet working as a team can successfully achieve their goal of creating an environment where Ricky feels heard, validated, and supported. Wow, that looks really painful. Ricky, this didn't have to happen. Thanks. I feel bad that we didn't figure out what was going on sooner. You don't. There's no way you could have known. Oh, maybe, but I still feel like we should have known something from how you were acting. I worked real hard not to let you know. Why? I didn't want you to know what they were calling me. And I really didn't want you to do anything. It would have made everything so much worse. Why didn't you want us to know? Did you think it would make us mad? Yes. They called me a faggot. They're always calling me that every day, making fun of how I walk, how I carry my books, what I wear. Look, that was wrong of them to do that. And I probably would have wanted to do something to make it stop too. But you can't take this knife to school. That's all I was doing with the knife. I wasn't going to kill him, just scare him, make him stop. What if they'd taken it from you? Or, or you'd accidentally hurt one of them. Taking this knife to school wasn't making you any safer. It was actually jeopardizing you and I. I needed to defend myself. If you come to us with this, we can help you try and figure out how to handle these kinds of things. But I didn't want you to ask me questions. What kind of questions? About being gay. I didn't want to talk about it. Not with you, maybe not with anyone. Then you don't have to. Ricky, this is not about being gay. This is about making good choices. If somebody's hurting you, it's important to let your mother and I know, not take matters into your own hands. We're responsible for your safety. If we don't know you're in danger, we can't do that. So, you don't care if I'm gay? No. We care that you're safe and happy and healthy. Now, you've been suspended for the rest of the semester. But if you go to counseling, and keep your grades up at the alternative school, you might be able to get back into your old school next no, year. I don't want to go back there ever. Okay, then you don't have to. But we'd still like you to get some professional help. Help for what? I didn't do anything wrong. It was those guys who did this to me. Didn't do anything wrong, Ricky. You took a weapon to school. Now, what they did wasn't right either. But you have got to learn how to communicate your feelings with an adult that can help you deal with them when there's a problem. Until your mother and I feel like you can, we're going to insist that you come home every day right after school. Now, you can have friends come over here, but right now, we don't think it's safe for you to go anywhere without us. Does that make sense? Same for the internet. I want to make sure the sites you're going on are healthy and are giving you the right idea about how to deal with your feelings. So, your mother and I are going to screen all your websites, and you're only going to be allowed to go on the ones that we approve first. None of this is fair. You guys are punishing me for being bullied. I understand. But we're doing it to make you safe. You can't make me safe. We might not be able to make you safe, but we can teach you how to keep yourself safe. If you can't figure out how to operate in a safe way, you could end up in jail. Or worse yet, hurt or hurt somebody else. Okay? No, but... I, no, no buts about that, Ricky. Your safety is our number one priority. As soon as we feel we can trust you to conduct yourself in a way that won't get you hurt without us monitoring you, then we'll let you do it. Okay? I guess so. Although Ricky isn't thrilled with the fact that he'll still have to face consequences for taking a knife to school, his anger has been diffused his hurt has been acknowledged and he feels supported. Because Todd and Janet let Ricky know that they cared about his safety more than what his sexual orientation may or may not be, their lines of communication are more open 
and consequently their relationships are strengthened. Todd and Janet have earned Ricky's trust, so they'll be better able to face future challenges together. For more information on the techniques used in this video and for downloadable cheat sheets, go to www.getresultswitheffectiveconversations.com. That's www.getresultswitheffectiveconversations.com. Although these scenarios end with the child accepting correction, that's not going to always be the case the very first time you practice these parenting skills. But with patience, practice, consistency, and time, you will get better results with these techniques. We are so grateful to the contributors to these videos. They include Greg and Mary Thompson, Mark Hell Insurance Company, Connie Clendenin, MSW, Valley Teen Ranch, Dr. Karen Bergstrom, Safe Families for Children, Irene Clements, National Foster Parent Association, Corky Kinsvater, MSW, Talon Grief, CMHC, LPC, Mara Ziegler, MSW, Barbara Thatcher, MSW, Susan Hess, LCSW, IL, USC School of Social Work, and Nicholas Bruce, LMFT, Compassion LA.